Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. Just wanted to say the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. To find out more, you can go to www.listenfrederick.com, where we are rejoined by the Washington Post's best, their very own Mr. Sam Fortier. Thank you so much for blessing us on this fantastic, beautiful Monday evening. Sam, how are you doing? I'm doing well. The mics both saluted, so I felt like I had to do it, too, to be in the cool kids club. Yeah, Pure pressure still you. works. Yeah, I was a king of peer pressure. I was giving everybody peer pressure, so I understand it. It's just like an aura thing. Yeah, Reed does totally understand it. But this episode is titled First Impressions there, Mr. Fortier. So my question to you, what was your first impressions of the rookie at rookie minicamp? That was a lot of fun to see in person, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say I always kind of hedge whenever I talk about these sort of offseason workouts because obviously – they're going against air. It's brand new. Everybody's trying to do their best and be on their P's and Q's to, to make Ron like them. Um, so I'm always wary, wary of reading in. But with that said, I was very impressed um, not only with Jahan Dotson, but Cole Turner um, as pass catchers, as athletes. Um, there was one play um, where Sam Howell kind of threw early on, on a back shoulder to Jahan Dotson. And Jahan, like the ball was maybe like right here, about, about six inches away. And he grabbed it, uh, and I was like, okay, maybe that's why Daniel Jeremiah said he had the uh, best hands in the draft. Yep. Um, Cole Turner, long, athletic. Um, he definitely, I think, could be a contributor right away in the red zone, uh, on third down, things like that. Um, and then just some other first impressions, I would say uh, – Percy Butler brought a lot of baggage uh, for three days. And, and I, I saw like, that. Oh, I, I thought you, like, I thought you meant like off the field issues. I was like, oh, oh no, like, already three giant suitcases for a three day. Oh, literal kick. baggage. OK, literal yeah, baggage. Yeah. OK, uh, I saw somebody commented on the uh, on the feed of that and they said, looks like Percy's moving in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he, he said like him and the his team. The, his agent and the team like got mixed up and he thought he was staying until June 23rd. And he was staying until Saturday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's not that's, good. Yeah, no, that's pretty. Hey, at least he's not going to run out of any outfits. So <laughs> what was, what was your impressions of Brian Robinson and what kind of role do you think he's going to play in this offense? I mean, a lot of people, of course we have Antonio Gibson. He's been fantastic. And we have JD McKissick, but I, I think that they, this team really likes Robinson. Yeah. I, I think that his role will primarily be, like short yardage like Peyton Barber, but with a higher ceiling. Um, to me, it's like if you guys think back to that Tampa Bay game where they were controlling the clock, keeping Brady off the field, the defense was was doing its part. I think instead of seeing Antonio go 20 carries for 70 yards or whatever that was, you're going to see Robinson get that role, not only because he has the ball security, but because, uh, you know, he is that short yardage. He's a physical back. Um the first handoff he took in a, in a commander's uniform, he actually fumbled, which he didn't do last year, but he and Sam Howell like miscommunicated. I couldn't tell which one of them like was at fault, but basically it fell on the ground and running backs coach, Randy Jordan, like got after him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Robinson did 10 pushups, came back, was ultimately fine. He flashed some hands actually uh, running routes, whether it be the swing or, you know, uh, uh, and running into the flat. Um, so it was, uh, you know, he, he showed some hands. I, I think they do like him. That's sort of the role I envision him in early on. Right, right. And um, obviously post-draft, like there can still be some free agent signings here and there. I would kind of say that as far as like overall talent goes, offense is kind of set. You could probably add some more defensive pieces. Do you see them adding anybody else uh, before training camp starts? Yeah, I, I agree with you that the offense is pretty much set. I could see another depth tight end, but otherwise I, I think they're pretty good there. I think you've got your unit. But on defense, as you said, I think that they still have needs, particularly at linebacker. Ron said on Friday, if we're looking at one position to be linebacker, I would argue they could use another depth defensive tackle as well as another depth defensive back, particularly at corner. We can have a James Bradbury discussion if you guys want to a little bit later. But at linebacker, I think, is, is the number one concern here because um, last year, the last the first two years of Ron Rivera's tenure, they have not been very good there. They whiffed on the guy that they thought was going to be the solution. Um, at the end of the year, Ron Rivera said he didn't expect Cole Holcomb to be 
the long-term guy because he struggled with communication among other things. Now, you know, Jack Del Rio just gave an interview with the team website. Yep. Ron Rivera said at minicamp that Cole actually could be the solution. Um, but even, even if he is the mic, I still would expect them to add a guy or two. And we all know the relationship. The I know we've heard the the jokes, the commanders, and everything like that. But you mm-hmm. brought up James Bradbury, Sam. Do you think that? Do you expect Washington to go after James Bradbury? I mean, you have to always leave that door open because of the Ron Rivera former Panther relationship. Um, but. I imagine that James Bradbury is just going to cost too much. I mean, mm. uh, Washington already has two veteran corner contracts in, in William Jackson and, um, and Kendall Fuller. Uh, so I imagine that, that he is going to get not maybe not the $10 million a year that he was you know going to get from the Giants had they not released him. But I imagine he might be a little bit out of the price range. Um, I, I don't think that means there's a lack of interest. Uh, but Ron obviously had the opportunity to bring him here once uh, and, and didn't do it. Mm-hmm. So I understand it. I think that anything is possible with those kind of guys, but I am I am healthily skeptical that he'll end up here. Right, right. And I mean, I know you talked about him a little already with his miscommunication with Brian Robinson, but of course we got to ask you about Sam Howell. Everybody was very excited about him coming here. Uh, my favorite video of Sam Howell is the video where he t- calls Deami Brown um, – when he's after the after he gets drafted huh. and he I did not expect him to speak like that. I'll just say that I did not expect that <laughs> we out you we out you yeah I call you later I was like whoa Sam that's, all right that's, dog. that's not how he sounded when he was talking to the uh, Washington commander no no no, it's not. No, no, no 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 so shout out to shout out to his family love that for him um <laughs> what what how has he looked and, and do you think that there is a reason why he was picked in the fifth round or do you think that he still has the skills that he should have maybe went a little bit higher uh, I, I think that him being picked in the fifth round was really reflective of the quarterback slide writ large that right. we saw, whether it be Malik, you know, or, or um, any of those guys or Desmond Ritter, any of those right. guys. Um, I think that a lot of very smart people see that he has a future as a potential starter in this league. Bucky Brooks of NFL network. I know wrote about it recently and Daniel Jeremiah, who I brought up already um, said that, you know, they're not, consigning this guy to like the future clipboard clipboard holder for his career bin um and not that i mean that's a great job if you can get it not to say bin right. but <laughs> i mean they think he has some potential in this league you know what i mean uh i i would say that um that's i think how they're viewing him obviously they do not want to turn to him obviously this year i think even next year right. because if carson wentz considering the picks you gave up, considering the money you allocated, considering the other roster moves you had to make. If he's out of here in one year, unless Sam Howell is like that dude and becomes like a top 10 quarterback, like that's a failure if Carson's here for one year. Mm, Um, And I think that that Ron Rivera is probably didn't take that step forward in year three that he wanted to. And I, and I would, you know, put him firmly on the hot seat, but that's getting a little far down the line. Sam Howell, uh, had great deep ball accuracy. I think that's the thing that we heard about him throughout the draft. Um, we saw him kind of let it loose um, for a couple 30 yard, 40 yard passes. Um, and, and I mean, he was putting it in the bread basket. Uh, again, I, I try not to read too much into that, but, um, and, and I would also say that for a, a rookie, you know, like he was the guy taking charge out there. Like when they were going tempo, when they were, um, you know, getting protection set. Like he had no problem being assertive, being that guy, um, you know, people come w- walking back to the huddle and he's high-fiving. It's, it's, it's those little things, but it shows you that he was, you know, definitely comfortable being the, the guy out there, which he was with just the rookies and, and UDFAs and, and stuff in camp. Right. So real fast to our listeners, what Sam is saying is that he is destined to be a pro bowler and he's going to be a long-term <laughs> starter. So you guys are there first. I mean, let the, yeah, let yeah. The put that down. <laughs> Make that a headline. Yeah. <laughs> Right, and uh, speaking of the guy out there, obviously Washington acquired Carson Wentz this offseason, and a lot of people going into the season after that uh, acquisition kind of had Dallas and uh, Washington kind of ranked one and two. And then obviously Philly comes in, has a pretty good draft. They make the trade for A.J. Brown, and it seems that uh, Philly's kind of creeped up people's rankings in the NFC East. How would you rank the NFC East right now post-draft? Ranking them in May. You guys, are, you guys are putting me on the spot here. I like it. We're running um, out of material, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much to talk I would about say, right now. I would say knowing what we know now, uh, let, let me just say first, the draft, the offseason, the NFCEs got bigger and badder. Like, if, if we talk about the first round, the smallest dude picked before Washington picked was Kayvon Thibodeau at, like, 6'5", 265. Mm-hmm. Like, 
the tackle that the Giants got and Evan Jordan Davis, Mills. like, yeah, like, like this is this is going to be a, a problem. Um, right now, if I had to go, I would I would still put Dallas first, uh, which which I know y'all hate to hear, but when you talk about quarterbacks, Dak is I, I think the best one, the most consistent one of the bunch. Um, you have an explosive offense. I, I think uh, what their defense did with Micah Parsons last year was impressive and, and not a fluke. Um, so they're still they're, they're the team to beat. Um, I do have Washington second uh, because I think that Carson at his best, um, if you can get, you know, I know there's going to be those lows, but I still think at his best, um, he's the second best quarterback in the, in the division. Um, I think the defense can't be as bad as it was last year, especially to start. Um, I mean, they, they can, but I, I don't think it will be. Um, and then I got Philly, I got Philly third because they're doing everything they can to support Jalen Hurts, obviously going, you know, big on, on offense with AJ Brown. Um, and, and even though I think their defense is, is going to be a problem and, and I don't think they're going to be able to run the ball as much as they did last year, um, they're still going to be a strong unit. And then the Giants in fourth. I, I like the moves they've made. Um, I think they're on the right trajectory, especially post Joe Judge and, and Dave Gettleman. But uh, I, I just don't think Daniel Jones is, is you know, cap- is, is going to be capable of, of doing much more than third. Yeah. Right. Dan- Daniel Jones is another Giants quarterback that has a just constant dumb face. He's just always like Eli, just always <laughs> looks dumb, just always lost. They're very, really very close. That's that's, uh, yeah. that's organizational philosophy when it comes to quarterbacks. Right. You yeah. the you just have to have a stupid face. I'm just, just surprised dumb. they didn't sign yeah. Mitchell Trubisky in that breath. Then, uh, but my next my next <laughs> question point. for you, the next ca- question for you, Sam. This was the first time this rookie meeting camp that we were able to see the helmets live in person and in action. So, what did you think of the helmets? I got to admit to you guys that I am not a big Jersey guy. Like most of the time, like in the press box, everybody's having debates like, Oh, the the white on white is the best uniform or the burgundy and the the gold pants. Like I'm not someone who jumps into those, but I will say that the helmets were pretty sick. Like uh, the Chrome, like the way that those looked, I was like, I'm not even a big uniform guy. I was like, all right, those are real. Those are for real. Right. Yeah. Something about the pictures too, where uh, like it's the matte burgundy, everything's burgundy. And then they have the yellow stripe, but then like the yellow clips on the visors just really kind of make yep. it stand out when people are wearing those. I just think it looks so good. But uh, you talked about Percy Butler a little bit, of course, uh, with his baggage. Those are your words, not mine. Uh, all the baggage <laughs> that he has. <laughs> but what kind of role do you expect him to play on this defense? I know Ron said he expects him to play over 50 percent of the defensive snaps. Yeah, I mean, like, they have really high hopes for him. Um, They said he's going to uh, compete at a couple spots, including free safety, where he was a three-year starter at Louisiana, as well as Buffalo Nickel. We know that that slot defender in their big nickel sub package, um, really important to Jack Del Rio, uh, was played by Landon Collins second half of last year before he got hurt. And and I think the numbers, the film, everything shows you that that's when this defense was at its best. Um, That Tampa Bay game we talked about, you know, them being able to disguise the coverages. Um, that's where Cam Curl broke out in 2020. I am a little skeptical that Percy Butler could bring uh, as much value as Curl um, and Collins did in that role, just because uh, he is not as, I think, refined a, a tackler. So I, I would say, like, if teams run at him, is that going to be, you know, in the, in the draft process, I mean, a lot of scouts said this guy has instincts, he has physicality, toughness, he has all those traits that you want but he'll freelance at times uh, and, and he's a little bit, he's, he's really inconsistent with his tackling technique because he, he trusts those traits a little bit too much. Um, so basically my question is, can rock Rogers, the secondaries coach, can, um, can Chris Harris, the defensive backs coach, can they, you know, refine his game and get him where he needs to go? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> that's a great uh, kind of leads me to my next question to piggyback off of that. Um, you mentioned Landon Collins, and there's been kind of rumors floating around that there's a possible return out there. If if Butler can't really latch on and kind of pick up that role, the the Landon Collins role, the Buffalo Nickel role, see Landon Collins possibly returning. So I just want to say that I I think this all started with an Instagram story from Landon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then like which I get like th- there was but then there was there was a blog I don't remember which one but at the end it was like. That, like this seems like it's going to happen and I was like I don't know if like Landon expressing like he likes it like means it's going to happen and so I would say like I, I don't know if if you know it, it's possible that he comes back but I think that there are a lot of hurdles that people haven't discussed when it comes to a reunion which is one money I mean that dude was was getting the bag before he got released and he's definitely going to want to get as close to that as possible does Washington have 
the resources and or the appetite to pay him that, mm. you know, what, whatever we're talking, because we're probably talking, you know, six, seven, eight, you know, that, that it's that it would be my expected range. The, the second thing is, does he like this role? Because Landon, if you guys remember, was was very adamant that when he got shifted to Buffalo Nickel, that he was a safety. And Ron and, and Jack went out of their way to be like he is a downhill attacking role player or something. Like, like they just would refuse to use the word linebacker. And so, like, is he interested in coming back here or would he want to go to a team that has a bigger void at, at strong safety? Um, all of this to say it could still happen, but but I think – Sort of like James Bradbury, I, I am healthily skeptical about that one as well. I agree. And now to wrap this up, Sam, I got a couple more questions for you. But I just got announced earlier from your colleague, John Keim, that Coach Rivera won the award, the George Hallis Award. So if you can, kind of give us a description of the award and who that kind of goes to. Yeah, so it's from the Pro Football Writers Association of America, and it basically goes to a person that overcame, you know, really difficult situations. Um, uh, off the field or on the field to to keep doing their job and uh, obviously um, we know uh, from from 2020 and 2021 uh, Ron Rivera's battle with cancer uh, his ability to, to miss like three practices I think it was uh, to be on the sidelines uh, I remember um, you know seeing him come out of the tunnel after halftime and he would have to sit on the bench in those second halves um, so I know that you know, that was, we, we gave it to him on Friday and, and he was appreciative, which was just a cool moment. But that award is just really recognizing like kind of the, the human stuff he had to go through. Um, and obviously like it, it was not easy uh, to do that during that time in that organization uh, at that time in the world with the pandemic. Um, so just recognizing all he did for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I thought he got it for uh coaching under Dan Snyder and being successful for the last two years. So I was like, that's cool that they yeah. recognize when that. When you put it in perspective with COVID and everything like that, given yeah. that his health was susceptible to other illnesses and being it very, very harsh and he continued to work really says a lot about Ron Rivera. I'm glad that coach got it because we are lucky to have him here. But my last question for you, Sam, if you can look into your crystal ball, look at this team, what are the weaknesses on offense? All right. Um, I was about to say, here. if you really have a crystal ball on you, I'm going <laughs> to lose my mind. Um, the weaknesses, I, I think, start and end uh, at the quarterback position. Okay. Not not start and end, but, but definitely start there. Because for as high a ceiling as Carson Wentz can have with the physical traits, with the, all the throws that he can make, uh, I, I think the weaknesses are just his, his main inconsistency. You saw that at the end of last year from the Jacksonville game, uh, or, or excuse me, from the Arizona game where he played really well when they needed to win, and then how poorly he played in that Jacksonville disappointment that you know, probably spurred his, his trip out of town. Um, I, I think his inconsistency, and, and, and I think the main question there for me is like, if Frank Reich was was Carson's dude, the uh, the OC in Philly went to start his career, you know, his near MVP season. Uh, if he couldn't get Carson to take the check down uh, to be more consistent, is Scott Turner going to be able to do that? Um, so those, I think, that is the main weakness: is is Carson Wentz maybe uh, giving in too much to his own tendencies, um, you know, to play hero ball, things like that. Uh, I. I Receiver depth has to be on there because I spent all last season being like, wow, they're so deep at receiver. They're totally good. <laughs> and then and then all of a sudden, like, what happened? That's exactly uh, what we did. It's yeah. literally exactly what we did. I, I remember that interview. We're like, yeah, we're, we're like, oh, they're fine at receiver. We're good. Right. So one position, um, that's all of a sudden it's the deepest on this team. Right. I think Logan Thomas and his ACL, like the weakness, I would say tight end, having a well-rounded tight end uh, is a weakness because obviously Cole Turner is going to be the pass catcher. Uh uh, John Bates and Samus Reyes are, are going to be good blockers and, and John Bates can catch a little bit too, but uh, there won't be the yak that there is with Logan. Um, and then I would say the offensive line and running back, I think are solid. Like those are probably for me, two of the the most confident positions I have on, on the team. Um, but I would say the weaknesses, um, the weaknesses are, are, are Carson Wentz's uh, trusting his instincts too much and, and not be able to take hard coaching, which, which we've read about in, in Philly and in Indy. Uh, the receiver depth just because always and tight end with Logan. Uh, that was a charged question, Sam, because I was looking at, it's based on like depth chart uh, kind of way. And the way that I'm uh-huh. looking at this team is very well built, but I like the way you broke that down. Cause you went into yeah. it with like details and everything. So I appreciate you doing that, Sam. You're the best man. Uh, but before we get out of here, if you just want to plug your Twitter handle, just in case anybody watching here on YouTube would like to come and follow you on Twitter. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find my stuff uh, at Sam, the number four, T-R, S-A-M, the number four, T-R. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. You're the best, man. I'm glad that we were able to get you yes, on here. And Reed you, can actually be here as well. And uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you again at training camp here soon. Of course. Reed's going to get me in trouble with these Dan Snyder jokes. So I know. Um, <laughs> that's why I say it. That's why I do it. I <laughs> like to, I like to walk the line. All right, yeah. Sam. Have a good night. <laughs> Later, y'all. All right, right everybody. We just spoke with the man, Sam Fortier of the Washington Post. I, I love talking Sam's, to him. He's funny. Oh, yeah. Well. Sam's the man. And he, he's Sam's the man. Well, cool. And he's got a good and, sense of humor because a lot of people would be put oh, yeah. off by Reed's jokes, but, you know, oh, yeah, he just keeps coming. Sam embraces it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can tell. He actually, actually uh, responds to him as well. Yeah. So I was about to say, he loves it. Like, yeah. Awkwardly laugh. Like, <laughs> yeah. Most people. Most people. Yeah, they're like, oh, okay. Get me out of here. I'm not- <laughs> <laughs> Help me. All right, yeah. everybody. So let's move on to our, our fan questions. To wrap up the show before we are joined by our second guest and Logan Paulson. But this question comes oh, from God, our guy. Oh, God, I'm leaving before he comes on. <laughs> before our guy, Mike Puckett. His question is, and Hall, I'll go to you first. If Wentz goes 28, 28 touchdowns, 11 interceptions, and the commanders go 9-8, and eight, but we don't make the playoff playoffs, is Wentz our QB next season? Ron or no Ron? Um... Uh... So he has a good statistic, good year as from a quarterback, throwing twenty eight touchdowns, eleven interceptions. But we don't make the playoffs at ninety eight, nine and eight. I would probably say, I guess it's two sided. You could look at the defense and probably say that the defense probably most likely let let the team down this year if they end up nine and eight and missing the playoffs, just because obviously the quarterback wins and the defense are probably going to go hand to hand this year as far as this team's success. Or the other side of it could be. 28 touchdowns, what was it, 11 picks? Yeah. Um, 98, 9 and 8 record, but I guess it would look at it as did you really play clutchly and did you really play great, great enough to actually win us the game or were you just compiling your stats and your touchdowns and, and losing efforts pretty much? And I would have to say it would probably be the latter of that one with Wentz probably just like compiling, uh, throwing for like low completion percentage, stuff like that. Pretty much just – not being the reason why we win the game, but also not the reason why we lose the game. So I definitely could see uh, them moving on if they don't make the playoffs with Wentz. With that, I think Wentz would stay, Puckett. And the reason why I say that throwing for 28 and 11, that is really good, statistically speaking, for a quarterback that we haven't had here in Washington for some time. And so I can imagine this staff, with or without Ron, a new head coach coming in, maybe he's got somebody in mind. Uh, but that being said, being at 9 and 8, it's not like you're at the top of the draft order. So it's not like that coach co- that would come in if Ron wasn't here would be able to get a quarterback top overall so if you're a new coach would say I'm going to keep Carson because it's actually stable 28 and 11 and we'll fix the other issues but I don't think that is ever going to happen I think Ron is staying here for a very long time that being said even if they went 28 if you went 28 and 11 they went 9 and 8 missed the playoffs I still think Carson Wentz is the quarterback of the future here and they will make sure that he's going to be here because uh you You've, you've had this issue for so long, and you think that you fixed it, and just because the team overall doesn't live up to expectations but the quarterback position played well doesn't mean you should move on and create that problem for yourself again. I, I love Sam Howell. I love Taylor Heineke, but I don't want to force those issues if we don't need to. What about you, Reed? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if he did that, uh, I mean, it's still a two-game improvement over last year. I think he would eventually stay, but at the same time, I mean, the Colts gave up more than we did and they let go of him. And he had, I mean, he was better than he only threw seven interceptions. Like he tends to every year. One of those weird things. But, but then again, we know Ron that. Rivera. Well, hold on, hold on. Ron Rivera and them are not Ron Rivera is a lot more patient. I will say than Jim Mercer. And it seems like since Dan Snyder stepping back, it's kind of Ron's call. And I don't think Ron would all of a sudden you put it all on him because that's a pretty good, that's a decent season. I think he would think that he could build off that Carson could get some confidence and then they could continue going forward and they could win some more games. Plus, like I said, it's a improvement on the record. Uh, I think that, yeah, that would, that Carson Wentz would be staying and that they would be ready to move forward with him for another couple of years. Yeah. Now all I was going to say is that I think, at this, about that. I think at this point it's pretty evident that uh, Jim Mercy and Ballard walked away from Carson Wentz for not because of his play. They use right. that as an excuse, right. uh, but we don't need to get into politics here on this show. I'm just saying I believe in you, Carson. You're the man. Yeah. But the next question that we have is from the Colonel. Thank you, Colonel. He said, now that, now that we've basically constructed our team with a few more tweaks needed, how do you guys feel that we stack up against our division opponents' strengths and weaknesses versus theirs? So let's look at it. Let's look at first with the Giants. All right, let's make it easy. I was like, did we freeze? Yeah, cut out. 
Oh, maybe you guys did. I'm I'm still here. But l- so let's go no. into this and let's break down the divisional opponents, right? So let's look at first off. Let's look at the Giants at quarterback position. Taylor Heineke. I'm mean, not Taylor. Heineke, Carson Wentz and Daniel Jones. Obviously, they would do better there. I think right. it's easy to yeah. say that. Running back. Uh, who are we breaking down? You froze again. Oh, breaking running back. Who Saquon for, for Bart- just in the division? Um, yeah. So obviously, I think Saquon's the most talented running back in this league, but. If you look at it, I mean, and obviously you got to go, of course, Ezekiel Elliott, what he's done, even though he hasn't been the player that he was over the last few seasons. Um, But I mean, if you look, I don't want to put us first necessarily, but I will say you can make the argument in terms of depth. I mean, you have three legit guys that can go out there and they can play, they can be a bell call, they can play fantastic football. And I mean, you're going to be rotating all three of them. But I mean, I think that the Tony Pollard, Ezekiel Elliott duo over there in Dallas is probably number one in the division. All right, but let's look at the strengths in the offensive line for Washington, right? That's probably the strength of the offense right now. Where does it match up against the division, Hall? Uh, I would definitely say, obviously, we're above the Giants. They're still trying to rebuild their line, get their line solidified. Philly's line is pretty good. Obviously, they got Lane Johnson. Uh, I know Travis, uh, not Travis Kelsey, Jason Kelsey uh, retired, I think, but they actually, they got another guy to come and replace him pretty quickly. That's pretty good, pretty yep. solid. So uh, Dallas, obviously, they took, lost a couple guys. So you know what? I'll go probably us just because Yep. I'm going to go with us just because of the depth that we have. And also we had a Trey Turner, even though he lost Sheriff, you had Trey Turner, you had Norwell. And if you go back to last year, we were down to our fourth center, fourth position, like fourth left tackle, right tackle, whatever it was. And we were still pretty much a solid unit. So I think they can build off of that, continue building off of that. So I'll go us one, Philly two, Dallas three, and Giants four. Yeah. And then at the yeah. end of at the end of last season, it was kind of looked at with this football team that the wide receivers were a weakness for the commanders. So let's look at wide receiver Reed. Where did the wide receiver group for Washington rank up with the rest of this division? That's another tough one. I, I will say Terry's the best wide receiver in this division. I don't care. I know AJ Brown's good. CD Lamb's good. But I mean, give me Terry over any of them. Terry's never had a quarterback. Um, so I would go Terry's the best. But overall, as a unit, I mean, the Eagles definitely upgraded that. Just bringing in AJ Brown, him and Devontae Smith are going to be fantastic. Uh, and then, I mean, you look at the Cowboys. Yes, they did. They lost Amari Cooper, but you got to expect CD Lamb to take another jump. Uh, Michael Gallup's going to be another year returned from injury. And it's tough to say. I, I Damn, I don't know who I would put first now. Because, I mean, us adding Jahan Dotson, it really, that depends a lot on how he progresses. We know Curtis if, Samuel can be good if yeah, he's healthy. If Curtis Samuel's healthy. If right. Curtis Samuel's healthy and Jahan Dotson progresses, then I think you would have to put us near the top. But and if, but that, that's a lot of ifs. Um, yeah. Damn, I don't know. Who would you guys put first on that? Look, I, it's tough. <laughs> I would put Washington. I think you first. would put Kyle. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would put Washington <laughs> first. I'd put the Eagles second. Um, and just because uh, Devontae Smith, I think, is really good, like borderline oh, superstar. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, mm-hmm. AJ Brown is that level as well, probably above him. And so that's why I would put them at two. And then behind him, I would put the Cowboys, just because of CD Lamb, Michael Gallup coming off that ACL injury. You, you're it's not up to par with AJ Brown or Devontae Smith. So that's why I'd right. put them at third. And, and then at fourth is the is the Giants. Right. Just because we Kadarius Tony wants to get traded. They got Kenny right. Galladay, who didn't catch a touchdown pass last season. I think it's easy to put them at the bottom. Also, uh, real fast, but with the Cowboys, like, yeah, obviously, look, I mean, there could be an addition by subtract- subtraction thing. Maybe C.D. Lamb goes off, becomes a DeAndre Hopkins type, but you really can't say that their room is more talented after they lost Amari Cooper, you know? Right. So, I mean, they, I think the argument yeah. com- could be made for the Eagles, but I think that the amount of players that uh, Washington that's had just after gives the them- top two, yeah. then it's like what? See, you know? That's why. That's the only reason why I would go with Philly, just because we kind of put hit it on the head where it's a lot of ifs. Like yeah. obviously, we got to be healthy. If this Dehan Johnson, Dehan, John, Dehan, what Johnson. is going on? <laughs> I could not get that. I could got to not get his name out. If Jahan Dehan Johnson. Johnson. Jadon Hudson, Jadon, if Jahan, Jahan Dotson. Dotson, if Jahan Dotson uh, progresses, becomes the guy that a lot of people think he can be, then I definitely would put us second. Or I might put us first over the Eagles, but right now I got to put them first just because Devontae Smith and AJ Brown, I mean, those are like two studs. You're absolutely right. And speaking of studs, we are now joined by our second guest, friend of the podcast, Mr. Logan Paulson. You've been busy, sir. How are you doing on this Monday? I'm great, man. I get to talk to the best. What is it? What's your thing? Your best fan podcast in the DMV or something like that. That's yeah. exciting for me. There we go. Oh, man. thank you. Dude, hey, yeah, so you know, awesome, you Logan always is. know how to make us feel good. <laughs> yeah. You know? And now, 
Logan, blushed. the first question I have to ask you, you know, they just had the rookie mini camp, and there was one yep. prospect I asked you about in early March, and that was Cole Turner. And yep. they obviously like this kid a lot. Scott Turner brought him up individually in his interview with Julie Donaldson. What do you think of Cole Turner? So, yeah, as a, as a prospect, I think Cole Turner presents a, an interesting skill set. I think he's a little bit tight in the hips, but I think he has some traits that help him overcome that. I think when you evaluate him at Nevada specifically, very limited route tree. So it makes the evaluation somewhat difficult in terms of what his athletic ceiling is. Um, you know, but at the, you know, watching some of, I watched every single one of his targets after they drafted him. And there are times where you get to see kind of a more twitched up version of this tall, lanky guy, as opposed to this long strider. And then I think his best skill set um, is the fact that he catches the football like an absolute maniac. You know, he's contorting his body. He's one-handed catching. He's, he's not, he uses his size to his advantage which is a very intriguing skill set at this level. Cause like, you know, you can go one of two ways with that F for that move tight end. You can go small twitched up, think like Jordan Reed type player, or you go super tall and find a guy who's always open. And I think uh, after watching him at the rookie mini camp, like he catches the football as advertised. And I think he's just, he's interesting moving forward. I think, uh, I think his praise from Scott Turner is definitely well warranted. He's an exciting piece because he's gigantic. I got to interview him and that should be coming up on uh, commanders.com soon. But um, yeah, man, I, I like that a lot. I also like the other guy, Hodges from ASU. Like I think Hodges tape is a little bit better from college. Okay. Um, I think he's a little bit more fluid of an athlete, but in terms of production, I think you can't go wrong with what um, Turner brings. Right. Uh, uh, real fast. Uh, Cole Turner kind of reminds me of you with his stylish hair hanging out of his helmet, all nice and cute. Pretty like stylish, that. yeah. But his another, is a another more curly. Yeah, that it's, it is more. It's got more bounce to it, probably. But yours is probably better. But um, <laughs> real fast, I'll just Amari uh, Rogers is somebody too that nobody's talking about, but he's very athletic. I mean, he just switched over to tight end, but he used to play quarterback. And I mean, all things people are saying that they were impressed when they first saw him run routes as a tight end. They're like, okay, this guy can actually run routes. So, but yeah. it's going to be a learning curve. But, yeah, um, I, you know, like to your point, like, you know, you talk to people around the building and one of the things like I was like, oh, man, you got two good, good ones. You got the kid from ASU, you yeah. got the kid from uh, Nevada. And then uh, everybody uh, around the building goes, oh, man, that, you know, Ohio, uh, Ohio, good, nice, nice, solid guy. And, you know, I think he's got he's raw as a route runner in terms of watching rookie minicamp. But when you watch it play quarterback at Ohio, you see a big physical dude. And I think that's a really nice skill set. And again, to have three kind of hot, super high upside guys coming in in that rookie class with like height, weight, speed measurables that you like, like the kid Rogers from ASU, he had a 37 inch vertical. He's six, eight. Hodges you know I mean? did. Yeah. I like Damn. that is ridiculous. You know, it's something God. like that. He you didn't know, run well, but he jumped really well. So I don't quote it's 35, 37. It's big either way. So, it's crazy. And so obviously like that's, that's crazy to get those guys just kind of all here in the same building and, kind of makes you speculate about the rest of the tight end room but you know like in terms of having those guys here that's definitely an exciting proposition right, right. so that wasn't my question that was just us being best friends and talking um but anyway so uh Fedarian Mathis he's somebody that a lot of people of course were disappointed uh, because you looked at the board there was Brisker there was Nicobe Dean and, and I think a lot of people wanted to address that but what can commanders fans expect from Fedarian Mathis what is he going to bring to the table so Fedarian, like when I first did my initial run of him, I was like, man, this guy's just a really solid, extremely solid football player. And that's something that I value and I like. He's a guy who he's he's in the gap he's supposed to be in. He knows how to take on double teams. He plays with amazing arm length. And then when you revisit the tape post the draft pick, you realize he's got a little bit more twitch. He's competitive, man. He runs to the football. Like, I like him a lot. And in terms of draft value, that's something that's all this crazy nebulous, like, I don't know if there's that big of a difference between what he would bring to the football team and what a guy like Brisker would bring or a guy like Troy Anderson or a guy like Dean. Like, and so to me, the value there seems pretty solid. Is it maybe 10 picks high? You could make that argument. But I've also talked to teams around the league and they said, oh, he was a first round pick on our board. So if you go by that board, it's tremendous value, right? right. You go by somebody else's board. Like I think the consensus board at PFF has him in the third round, but you know, like I'm going to defer to what the NFL team's evaluation is giving as opposed to, PFF's consensus board. So I think yeah. I think fans should be excited about him. I think he's a nice, he's a good team player. Like that's what you know. Ron says that. Uh, Jack says that. His college coach said that. He's a guy who knows his role in the defense. He knows how to help his teammates out. He knows how to help the defensive line be better. So I think that's if I'm a if I'm a fan, I love. He's a captain. Like it's a good fit, good character guy. A guy who loves football. Like here in his interview, like he was like, I want people who love football around me. And that as an evaluator, it's like, 
This guy loves ball. He's physical. He's big. He's got the measurables. He's got room to grow. He's got great leadership qualities. Like, and if and he fits what you want to do defensively here, I think that's fantastic. Right. Plus, plus he's a thick old boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice old hips. <laughs> For football, that's yeah. For football, yeah, I mean, right. what, what are you oh, talking about? that that no. messed that messed no. Hall all up, man. <laughs> me off. Um, <laughs> they really did throw me off. Uh, <laughs> oh, like so a, another guy that they really liked, they drafted in the fourth round. Uh, it seems that Ron like kind of really goes out of his way to talk about him a lot. Is Percy Butler? I think they want him to fill that Buffalo nickel role, that kind of that Landon Collins role that uh, he played last year. What did you see from the tape, and how do you feel about that draft pick? Yeah, Butler, I think, is really – he's a fun guy to watch. You know, like, I went in with, like, zero expectations just based on what people had been <clears throat> reading and tweeting about him was the only kind of introduction I'd had to him. And, you know, obviously, they say great special teams player. He does all these things at a really high level. And I think when I turned on the tape, I was really impressed with how he ran to the football, how he tackles. Um, he plays post probably more. I got to talk to him a little bit when he came in for his visit. Um, and he said he probably feels a little bit more comfortable in the post. But I think, to your point, Mike, he – he looks good when he's in the box. He blitzes well. And I guess he runs the football in a way that gets you excited. Like he's not, you know, some safeties kind of take their time, let other people make the tackle. Like he wants to be in it. He wants to be in the mix. So I think with regards to safety and flexibility that he gives you, he gives you three pieces, right? He gives you, you know, he can play the post, he can play in the box, and then you can kind of move Cam Curl around. You get guys with positional flexibility, and I think that's always good. It just makes it tough on defenses. So I think it's great that Ron's talking about him because in terms of film and just kind of excitement and physicality, like I like – he was probably the most exciting guy, maybe because my expectations were so low, but a guy that is I'm, – I'm excited to see what he does because, you know, at the rookie, rookie minicamp also, again, you get to see tremendous feet and athleticism, and I'm just like, man, that guy is – because of those athletic traits could be something pretty cool. Yeah, and Jack Del Rio in his interview with Julie Donaldson uh, absolutely glowed about the kid. Actually said that he could play all three safety positions when asked based off what he brings athletically. But my next question to you, Logan, um, let's are you surprised at all that they didn't go after a linebacker? Um, A little bit, I guess, in the draft, a little bit, uh, and then free agency. But the free agency period is still going on, and they right. can bring somebody in now. And I, I just meant think, the draft, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, so I think uh, – in retrospect, no. I think in terms of what they needed, they needed a guy with great leadership and who great understanding of the position. And I look at um, the guys that were available, and Dean is one that comes to mind. I know a lot of fans were kind of pointing in that direction. And I think the medical issues, the tape is somewhat concerning. I know he's a big name. I know he's a good football player. But that defensive front for Georgia really kept him covered up. They didn't have to cover a whole lot. I really was concerned about his transition to the next level. Then you add on the injury. I don't think that's the right fit. So outside of that, you know, you got guys like Troy Anderson, you got like Muma guys who needed a little bit of time to develop. Do you want to take a shot at a high upside right. developmental linebacker again after going Jamin Davis last year? I don't think so. And I think, you know, when you go back and watch the film of Cole Holcomb over the course of 2021, you feel pretty good about what he brought to the table. Like, was it perfect? Absolutely not. But in terms of a guy who's getting better each year, Filling out that Mike linebacker role, I think you feel really good about what he's bringing. Um, can you upgrade? Absolutely. But I think linebacker is becoming slowly more devalued. And I think that's important for fans to understand. Mm. And especially in this system, like you can't just find some Joe Schmo off the street to come fit. You got to have a guy who can cover, who can take on blocks. They really stress these guys here. And so I think you kind of say, well, we've got two guys in house with extremely high upside. And one of them is kind of turning a corner and Cole. Let's see if we can get them both on the field at the same time. Let's add a nice kind of big body guy who understands how to play double teams, who can rush the passer a little bit in Mathis. And you say maybe that helps their development moving forward. So I think that that's something maybe that they were thinking about. Am I surprised? A little bit, but ultimately not really. Right. Uh, so I asked Sam Fortier about this earlier, and he had an interesting answer. Uh, Sam said that Sam Howell is a guaranteed Hall of Famer and probably a pro bowler this season. <laughs> no, but how, what do you see from Sam Howell? What, what do you think that uh, he brings to the table? Do you think that was good value in the fifth round? I think it's good value because it's a quarterback. I think right. you could put any name there and say it's good value. I know that may be a little me, probably. No, what's that? Even if like I was drafted by them, it would probably. Be yeah, you're like that's yeah, Mike Reed, great value. Uh, but anyway, the um, I think I think the thing with him is that like I was never 
I don't want to say I'm not a fan of Sam Howell because I'm a fan of like his competitiveness. I'm a fan of his leadership. I'm a fan of his interview process. Like he seems very mature. I love that. In terms of the tape, again, it's one of those guys. They run like an RPO system, very limited route trees. His running style is very akin to kind of like a big fullback, like a mm. slower Tim Tebow type running style. Like does that translate to the NFL? So to me, you're drafting a big arm with good leadership qualities and that's good stuff. I'm, I'm about that. But in terms of like a guy that's going to, you know, I think a lot of fans are like, Oh, he's the future of the position, like pump your brakes a little bit guys. Like he's not that, and he's got, he might develop into that, but like he's got some mechanical issues in terms of how he releases the football in terms of his footwork. Can he create throwing lanes in the offensive line? Big question mark, big question mark. How does he read defenses? Another question mark. He's got a lot of growing to do, but I like, I like the, the human, and I think that human, that competitor, is going to get better at football, and I think that's what you're betting on is that you've got the right kind of guy that's going to grow at the position. Right, yeah, he's a nice guy. <laughs> you know him? <laughs> yeah, you know. that's a <laughs> – Another guy, that, uh, one of the guys that Sam was throwing to over this past weekend was their first-round pick, Jahan Dotson. He definitely got it out correctly that time. Um, Jahan Dotson. yeah. <laughs> He um obviously like the fan base when he got picked and the picked in the first round was kind of I guess up in arms because Alave was on the board. They traded back and Alave was there. Obviously Jamison Williams was still on the board as well. So what did you see from him and how do you think that he's gonna fit into this offense? And also, sidebar, side note, do you think that with a healthy Curtis Samuel, obviously Terry's a stud, and if Jahan Jahan Dotson can develop, do you think this is enough of uh, pieces on offense? to take this uh, Scott Turner offense to the next level? Mike, just crushing amazing questions right there. Okay, um, let's see. Let's start with the first yeah, thing. Let's unpack this together. Yeah, let's start with the first thing. So do I think, uh, Do what do I think of the, the draft pick? I think it's actually amazing process, right? I think taking him at 16 might be a little bit of a, like a slight reach, but when you kind of aggregate that with the two extra picks that you get, I think then it's not even a question, right? Yep. Whatever you say about Alave, like he might be the best receiver of all time. I don't see that from his film, but I don't think he's worth, based on what I've seen from his film, um, the two extra players you get and Jahan. I actually had Jahan higher in my pre-draft evaluation. I think he runs better routes. I think he has more nuanced routes. I think he's got better hands. I think he shows better physical toughness. Like those things are important to me. And so I would have him a little bit higher. I thought he wouldn't go until 20 to 22. So again, that's a little bit of a reach, but who am I to say, if that's your best receiver on the board right there, and it probably was given the run on receivers, um, take him, right? I, Jamison William was my guy. I had him in my mock draft going to the commanders at 11. Like he was my favorite receiver in the draft. But again, with the ACL at 12, plus adding those two players, that's so important. The two players added right. with a team that's got a lot of holes, like that is that's so valuable, right? Because I, as much as I trust my evaluation process, I don't trust it that much. So I want to give myself more opportunities to hit on draft picks and find a gem later in the draft. So is it a little high? Yes. But I think the value in the trade favors the commanders and is going to is more conducive to a long term team building strategy. Right. In terms of his film, I love his film. Again, the route running, the hands, all those different things. The hands are elite, probably the best hands in the class. And I think that is something that is going to help him overcome a lot of ails that rookies have, right? Contested catch situations, he does a really nice job. He plays bigger than his 5'11", 185, which I love. And um, and then in terms of how it all fits together in the offense, I think that's the million-dollar question. I personally see Jahan as a more of an outside guy to Curtis Samuels, who I think is better inside. But I think they, the staff, prefers Curtis Samuels on the outside. Jahan in the slot, but Jahan does run routes from the slot. Again, that positional flexibility that like we talked about with a guy like Butler, that shows up with Jahan in a big way, which is exciting. And I think that um, that is kind of how it fleshes out, right? One, one or two of those young tight ends develops. You get another big kind of everyone's like, they don't have any big body receivers. Cole Turner's a played receiver in college. He played right. big slot receiver. So that's what he's going to be doing here in most situations. The kid from ASU has a little bit more inline ability, but he runs routes. He's a converted wide receiver, right? Yep. And then, you know what I'm saying? So you have that big body element. If one of those guys develops and you feel good about it. Cam so Sims is big too. Yeah. Cam Sims is huge, right? Again, like don't freak out about the size thing, right? They've, they've got big bodies here. And so it's just about 
how you feel Jahan fits in that slot role versus Curtis Samuel, because I think they both are very similar in that they can do both. I actually think, like I said this already, but Jahan's route running to me feels a little bit more polished. But again, you can use it in the slot or outside, depending on Curtis Samuel, where he feels more comfortable and projects better. Yeah, I couldn't tell you how many times we had you on here, Logan. We talked about the 11th overall pick, and you would start off by saying, I think the number one thing is to trade back. It's just finding yeah. that partner to do so. So yeah. it wouldn't make a lot of sense why you absolutely love the pick, not only just Jahan, but getting those extra picks because we all knew right. they needed more. But one yeah. move that happened to wrap this up, Logan, I got a couple more questions for you. Trey Turner was added to this offensive line for $3 million yeah. for a one-year contract. Do you love this move for the commanders? Do you think he's going to start and over, oversee Wes Schweitzer? Uh, I think it's I think it's something that you need to do at this point in the year, and it's a guy that you have some familiar with, some, some familiarity with. I haven't watched him yet; that was on my to do list for this week, okay. and so I don't know how he's been playing. But based on like preliminary pre PFF stuff, he played pretty well in Pittsburgh last year, right? And um, I think he uh, you just needed depth. I like West. I like the intensity and the violence he brings to the position, and his workout I like videos. Sadiq. Huh? What's that? In his workout videos, West oh, Fighter, he has crazy workout videos. I've worked out with him. I love it. He's like, really? he, me and him are like, we think very similarly. Anyway, right. so, and then Sadiq Charles, I think, is another guy that in terms of athletic upside, you you love. Like when I was looking at second day guards, second and third day guards, interior linemen, like Sadiq projects better than all of those guys. And he's on your roster. So like, don't worry about that. You've got a nice developmental piece. You've got a guy who's kind of, you know, had a lot of experience I think could probably, you know, honestly, I think it's better at center in terms of Wes Schweitzer, but <clears throat> a guy that gives you some flexibility, guard center, and then Sadiq with tremendous upside. Then you bring in the vet as like an insurance policy for training camp. If the vet shows he's got some legs, maybe he kind of wins out the spot. But I think it goes to one of those two younger guys, barring that there isn't an implosion by either one of them. <laughs> yeah, and that would absolutely be dreadful. Uh, nobody, <laughs> no, nobody would want that. But last question for you, Logan. James Bradbury got released by the Giants today, so I want to get your opinion. Do you think Washington should add him? I've talked about this so much, like my my free agency philosophy, philosophy with you guys. You guys could probably answer this question for me, but I'm going to do it because you guys asked me the question. <laughs> if yes, if the value is correct for this team is my is my answer, right? I think he's a good football player, and do you want good football players? I want good football players. Yeah. I want the best football usually, player. yeah. But if they're expensive as heck. I don't want them. Right. I, I, I can't afford them. Right. So if he says, Oh, I'll come over and hang out with you guys for, you know, 10 million bucks. All right. I'll sniff around that and see if we can make that work. Find a spot for him on the roster. If he wants to be a top paid corner in the NFL, I'm going to say, thank you very much, but I'm no longer interested in your services. And one of those is a great free agent move. And one of those, if we were to sign him for $20 million is a terrible free agent move. So it all depends on what he wants and how you think he fits with this team. Because I think he's a good football player. He was the highest graded cornerback, whatever that was, two years ago, 2020, right? And obviously a little bit of a tail off, but there's a lot of fluctuation in quarterback play, as the Washington fans have been privy to with William Jackson the third, right? Very good, a little bit of a down year. Maybe he bounces back, right? But I do think that's my philosophy. If the value is correct, absolutely sign him. If not, don't. And so that's like that's not an indictment of him as a player. That's just good business in terms of roster building. That's right. Don't be the early 2000s to mid 2000s Redskins. Be the 2022 Commanders. Don't overspend on this. Play yes, it smart, right. gang. Play it smart, gang. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. And Logan, you can go follow Logan on Instagram at Logan underscore Paulson 82. He has the best film breakdowns on Instagram, obviously. Go and check him out. Logan, I can't thank you enough, brother. It's awesome to be able to get you on here as a guest of our show. I know you're very, very busy doing this for a lot of others, but you always bring us the best, man. Dude, yeah. thank you guys so much. And this is this is the guy you're the guys that kind of gave me the jumping off point. Do you know that? Started here in the yeah. burgundy. Yeah, yeah. You hear that, Julie Donaldson and people? You guys can thank us for for <laughs> You're the one we, we like, man, man. I saw you on on the burgundy zone. Yeah. That's I honestly, that's what happened. So well, yeah. no way. Where? That no. was you you're on the radio. Very good. So both of hey. these things. Oh, wait, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I'll, take yeah. I'll take that. I'll take that, Logan. <laughs> Have a good I'm proud night, of you, Logan. my son. We raised you right. We raised you well. <laughs> Take these guys. Have a good one, Logan. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the man, Mr. Logan Paulson, again. Reed, yeah, why, do you, why do you have to make it so weird? I didn't make it weird. I'm his master splinter. 
<laughs> You're ridiculous. <laughs> See, you almost made me <laughs> right there. Um, but let's move on. Let's finish this episode with our fan questions. This first one's gonna be from Andy Lockhart in our Discord chat server. Oi! Thank you, Oi. Andy in the UK. Who do you want as the first game of the season for the Washington Commanders, huh? Uh, I could answer this on Friday, so I'm gonna have to stick with it. Oh no, that was a primetime game. So first game of the season. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, some would say you want to go with a softball, like an easy team, like the Texans or one of those kind of like bottom feeders to kind of get the momentum going. Not me. I want to be in Philly, in Philly, week one. Really? Return of Carson Wentz. Go get to see A.J. Brown on the field man-to-man week one against William Jackson. So, uh, yeah, I would go Philly, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. I, I like that a lot. I would just rather it be at home because the one thing you don't want is Carson, his first game as a commander in Philly, and then he doesn't come out playing well. You know, like I want him to build up that momentum yeah. when he goes back to Philly so he feels confident and, you know, like sticking those touchdowns. You look at like, what's up? What's good? Um, but this next one, first game of the season, I would say I, I still think it's the Cowboys. I, I would like to be able to face them week one just for revenge for the last two games of last season and how putrid they were I know Cole Holcomb had that pick six and we almost came back but it was just like a bad taste in my mouth after those two games I, I want some point, right what's you say no I said up until that pick the whole game was meh yeah it was right and I would like that revenge in week one you know I Dallas we talked with Anthony Armstrong on Monday and his first career catch and, t- and came in 2010 week one against the Cowboys I was at that game I remember Brian Arakpo getting held uh, as Des Bryant hey man play. Cost a touchdown <laughs> pass at the, end, at the end of the game. Man, I got some cupcakes. Why are you holding uh, me, though? I do remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I would absolutely love it for it to be the Cowboys week one just because it always is a huge buildup to that to that game, and I would love the Cowboys week one. What yeah. about you, Reed? Um, yeah, so I think you both are right. It's either Philly or, or Dallas. I would, of course, love it to be at home. But, Hall, to your point, a lot of people would say that they want to start easy. I would rather play the, some of the hard teams first. I mean, you saw last year Green Bay got stomped week one, and they're I mean, they're one of the best teams in the NFL. And so if you can get some of these easy, harder teams out of the way, maybe you get lucky and maybe they're just not ready to really start the season yet, and you can get them out of the way, then you can face some of the easier teams as the season goes on. That would be ideal. But uh, also, it's always nice to start 1-0. and So, uh, but – Anything can happen, but yeah, I think you got, it's got to be Philly or Dallas. Yeah, and I think A Rod was probably having withdrawal from Ivermectin. That's probably why he didn't play well week one. But, probably. Yeah, no, yeah. that'll do it. Now, this next question is from Tony Shivers in our Discord chat server. Thank you, Tony. You're the man, brother. What did you think of the helmets seeing them in action with rookie camp, Reed? Oh, Tony. It gave me shivers because it looks like your last name is spelled Shiver Shivers Timbers, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Shivers. No, dude, those new hobbits look so good. I remember, like, just it's crazy what, uh, like, three months will do because everybody was always like, the helmets are so – it took you that long just to come up with that. Now everybody's like, dude, those helmets, that matte finish. And, like, we talked about, like, the all burgundy and then, like, the yellow clips when people wear visors just pops out so much. Or I'm sorry, the gold, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's gold, but it's yellow is what I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> Uh, but no, I love them. Too. I'm obsessed with the helmets. And, and like I said, even the alternates, I know that they haven't really put them on yet, but you can tell that they look better when they're on the newer helmets as opposed to on Jonathan Allen's 1992 style helmet. No offense to John. I mean, I love the guy. He stole my soul and he, and Hall's, but. Yeah, he stole Hall's <laughs> soul. He can't steal that yeah. that light from Hall. Uh, but I, I agree with you with John Allen. I thought that in that photo shoot, maybe they should have put a black visor um on his helmet to make it give it that kind of like mean attitude kind of look. Uh, take away yeah. his eyes because it, right, it does right. add to it. But I absolutely love the helmets. I love this entire process. I wish we could have seen like a mix match of helmets of with the the different players. Like maybe defense was wearing the black helmets and offensive players are wearing the burgundy ones. I would have liked to see him in action that breath. But I loved him. I still think the helmet is probably the best in the game at the moment. I, there's still things that they can do to make it look really good. Uh, but I absolutely loved seeing them in action for the first time. I know Keith and all of them were giving us crap for breaking down those uh, those videos of the players coming out. But look, man, it's May. There's nothing going on. <laughs> the have draft fun, already man. happened. What else is there have to do? Fun, right? man. That's, yeah. That is it. But I absolutely loved, I loved the helmets. I just loved everything about it. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm with you guys. I mean, you guys pretty much touched on everything. Helmets are fire. I mean, honestly, I've been to like a couple events for like like the uh, the rebrand event and a couple other events here and there. So I've seen the helmets. Like, obviously, I haven't seen them like up close and personal like that, but I've seen them in cases and like from far distance. So 
definitely look fire. And honestly, it kind of makes me want to see what the rest of the jerseys look like with the helmets on. So, yeah, yeah. Week one I'm, ex- to hurry up. I'm excited to see the different jersey combos. Like, uh, I've, of course, we've seen photoshops of the white and then the burgundy pants. But like, I want to see the burgundy jersey on the white pants, see how that looks and just mix and match it. I'm so excited. Guys. Now, the last question for this show, we're going to wrap up with Jeff Miles. Hefe. We always we always get at least one under, underdog win a year. Last year, it was against the Buccaneers. Prior to that, it was the Steelers. Who do you think it'll be this year and why? He thinks it'll be the Packers this year, personally. What do you think? Mm. Uh, I don't know. Come back to me real fast because I got to re- refresh my memory. All right. We're playing. Go, Hall. Um, yeah, Packers would be a good choice because we kind of always pay the, play the Packers pretty well, pretty tough. Um, I would go underdog win. I'm trying to think of our schedule. Do, 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 do. I'll go the Browns. Uh, okay. Obviously, I don't, don't. I don't know when we're gonna play them or what time of the year. I don't know Deshaun Watson. That'd would be, be a there. good game to play Week One. Just saying. Yeah, that would be a good one to play Week One as well. I, I don't know who the quarterback would be. Like uh, what time of the year it'll be. Um, but with or without Deshaun Jackson, that team is still loaded on offense and defense. And I think it would be, uh, especially Week One. That's a pretty good point. I think that would be a pretty good uh, litmus test on where this team yeah. is at as far as – especially because the AFC is already loaded. They're one of the top teams in the AFC with Deshaun Watson. So, yeah, I think that would be a great test for uh, our offense to go up against a defense like that. You can't, Got one. He, he struggled oh, yeah. to say Jahan Dotson, but he, this man nailed litmus like like it was nothing. <laughs> what about – all right, Reed. Oh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> the most talented team in football last year, I mean, the, they were especially on that winning streak that they went on, the Indianapolis Colts. Carson Wentz has a fire in that man more than just on his head and on his beard and stuff like that because he's a ginger. He's got a deep down in his soul to prove Jim Irsay and Frank Third Reich messed this up. <laughs> <laughs> he's, and he's going to go out there and he's going to get ready to stop it. It's going to be in. <laughs> Indianapolis and uh I'm excited for that game especially I mean we do very well against pocket passers I know that some of these quarterbacks like uh Deshaun Watson always scares me because he's so mobile and we always seem to struggle with that but uh I think that we're gonna feast on old Matty Ice out there we're gonna turn him into Matty on ice because he's gonna be on skates you know what I'm saying I hope Chase Young is back for that game he actually like hits Matt Ryan this time instead of just kind of like weirdly (laughs) yeah yeah, does some awkward little playground shove yeah Hey, he, he, had, the- he had a good reason to, man. The NFL was crazy at that time oh, yeah, with all no, this. They still flagged him for it. Yeah. Yeah. Remember? So, yeah. Could have just took his head off at that point. Dude, yeah. I, don't, I don't even want to remember back to that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, but the one underdog, I'll say the Cowboys, just because the re- like the NFL obviously just loves the Cowboys, always gives them the up. Everyone, it's a consensus that they put them in the first in division. This fan base also loves the gas up the Cowboys. Can't tell you how many people I got in arguments about Micah Par- uh, Minka Persons uh, and <laughs> stuff like that. So, look, I-, I would rather it be the Cowboys. That be the sweeping of the underdog. I don't want to go just for one. I want to go for two. Not, not only two, I want to go for three. I'm going to beat right. him twice a regular season once in the playoffs. I would love to be able to do that. And, and uh, much like Jerry Jones's Tuesday nights, I just hope that that is a car crash of a season. You know what I'm saying? Did you see that video oh, of him getting dude, into that car accident? That. He's okay. Not... He was completely fine. He's 80. Know, the DoorDash guy that he got into an accident with finished his delivery. He's fine. They're fine. Okay. It's okay. All right. As long as you yeah. say it's okay. It's just, it's yeah, it's good. Trust me. Up, it's dude. fine. Car accidents right. are cool. No. <laughs> All right, everybody, we will be back on we'll be back on Friday, everybody. All right, I'm Kyle. I don't like car crashes. I'm home. <laughs> and I am a big proponent of car crashes. No, I'm not. I hate them, too. Uh, they're frustrating wow. and they're scary. Right. But I just saved a bunch of money. Oh my, never mind. Yeah, I'm like, I'm dead. All right, everybody, we'll see you on Friday. Have a safe, great week. And we want to hear from you guys in the YouTube comments. We want to hear how you feel about the drive class, Sam Howell. And Logan Paulson basically saying, look, calm down on Sam Howell. Or do you guys want to listen to Logan? Or are you going to turn up the volume a little bit on your like Sam Howell? Like Sam did. Yeah, I like, like, like Sam Fortier did. Say he's the greatest quarterback of all time. I'm just going right. to say that. I like that, that little funny, tidbit though. that he said uh, linebackers are kind of becoming obsolete. They are, uh, essentially. Yeah. And especially with like the N'Kobe Dean type. Did you see that N'Kobe Dean fired his agent after he slipped through the fr- uh, couple, first couple rounds? <laughs> really? that was good for him. Yeah, stand up for yourself, dog. <laughs> All right, everybody, we'll see you on Friday. Be safe. Washington football. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. 
Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Hey!